So uh, welcome, Graham. We we met quite a few years ago now at uh, at SOAS, where you were teaching, I was studying, and uh, we both therefore have, have dipped our toe into the world of yoga studies academically, as well as you know, from the perspective of being teachers and practitioners. And uh, I wonder if you could say a little bit about your own academic background. Uh, what what motivated you to to go all the way and, and do a PhD? <laughs> all the way. Yeah, all the way. All the way. But yeah, thanks, Daniel. It's, it's a pleasure to, to, to chat with you about this. Um, I don't know how much you know. I mean, I spent quite a bit of my life working as a, as a commercial lawyer mm. uh, in the city of London. And I I got increasingly fed up with that for all sorts of reasons we don't need to talk about now. Um, and I basically, I eventually got out of that world at the beginning of 2004. Hmm. Um, I was already teaching yoga at that point. Uh, I'd been teaching yoga for a few years. Um, and I guess what sort of happened was that I realized not very long after leaving the, the, the legal profession that teaching yoga, just teaching regular yoga classes, wasn't providing me with the intellectual stimulation mm. that I was getting from being a lawyer, you know, for better or for worse. Um, so I, I started off, I took some evening courses. There was a time when Birkbeck, part of London University, uh, they may still do this, I don't know, but they, they were offering quite a lot of interesting evening courses. So I took one on Indian philosophy. Uh, I took another one on Buddhism. Uh, in the early 2000, I suppose, 2000 and but actually, I think this was even before I left the legal profession, so it was like 2003, something like that. Um, and on one of those birthday courses, I met somebody who had been to SOAS and she'd done a BA in religion at SOAS. <clears throat> and we were chatting at one night in the pub after one of the lectures, as one tended to do in those days. <laughs> and um, she said, oh, you should go back to, you should go to SOAS, you should go and do, do the MA in, in religion. Mm. And I sort of thought, you know, my initial reaction was, why would I want to do that? And then I thought, okay, maybe this is it, maybe this is something I should investigate. So I, I started exploring a little bit what that would involve. Um, uh, and I got as far as really getting ready, you know, getting the application form and all the paperwork ready to send in. And then I got cold feet uh, and decided not to do it. I then went on a, a, a yoga holiday. I was in Greece uh, and I got chatting to somebody I know in the yoga world and talking about how I thought about doing this and then decided not to and so on. And he said, oh, but you should do it. You've really got to do it. I don't know why he said this, but he did. And <laughs> so basically to cut the long story short, I applied a year later than I'd initially intended to. And one of the results of doing that was that my very first lecturer at SOAS was the guy who taught those Birkbeck courses oh, wow. back in, in the early 2000s. And as things were developed, he became one of my PhD examiners. Um, and, and we got on quite well. And so... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I did the MA in, it was technically MA in religions, but my focus was very much on Indian religions. Uh, and of course, with my sort of yoga teacher hat on, that was playing a part in that. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I got my MA. Um, somebody else at SOAS, another lecturer at SOAS said, well, are you going to come back and do a PhD? And I said, no, I don't think so. <laughs> um, and then... Again, I was traveling. Why do these things happen when you're traveling? I don't know, but I was traveling. Uh, and, and three, I, three connecting threads, traveling, PhDs and yoga practice. They're all roads to nowhere, aren't they? In some I ways. guess that's probably right. Yeah, <laughs> and I, was, I, was, I was traveling and I, I started thinking about this a little bit more and what I might I, what I might do a PhD on if I chose to do it. And the long story short, I, I did go back to SOAS uh, a year or two later and uh, embarked on a, a PhD part time, which finally came around I, I finally finished that in 2018 yeah. so that's my and then I suppose the other academic side of that you talked about where we first met I as is quite often the case when one is working on a PhD one gets asked to do some teaching 
Um, and in particularly also because of my yoga teaching background and also that I've been involved in training yoga teachers, uh, I was asked to stand in for somebody who was on sabbatical on the MA in traditions of yoga and meditation, which mm. by this time SARS had set up. Um, and that was where, of course, where we met, so a, a year or two later. So I, I did some teaching at SOAS on that. I taught some undergraduate Hinduism at SOAS. I taught some other sort of bits of comparative philosophy at SOAS um, up until um, about a year or two ago, I guess, when mm. I stopped. And then at the same time, you know, obviously you, you obviously had to have quite a lot of commitment to stick at it over all those years, uh, but didn't want to turn it into an academic career, it seems. Um, you've, I guess Correct. still got <laughs> some of you know, a foothold in that world through having the PhD. You could, should you choose, um, you know, turn that into something. But um, I'm curious as to why you didn't want an academic career. Um. I guess there are a number of reasons. One is that I think I'm probably too old anyway to, to, mm. to embark on a, an academic career from scratch, which is effectively what it would be. Um, so that was one very practical reason. I also didn't want to recommit myself to a full-time job, mm. which would, probably would have meant giving up my yoga or some of my yoga teaching and, and teacher training that I do. So I didn't really want to commit to that. Um, and I also felt I didn't really want to get sucked into the academic world in, you know, in too much, too much depth. Um, Why not? What's, what's, uh, no, what's I mean, that, that sounds awful. <laughs> that sounds awful. Um, I, I found that it could be quite bureaucratic, mm. uh, and I'm you know, coming from a background, or admittedly from a you know a, a very large law firm that I worked for. In many ways, one of the reasons I, I wanted to get away from the law was that I didn't want to get sucked up into more administrative, bureaucratic type functions, mm. and I could see how easily that can happen in, in an academic role, uh, and I, I, that just didn't interest me. Uh, so in the same way as one of the reasons I wanted to, one of the reasons I got out from being a lawyer was because I actually wanted to be a lawyer. Does that make any sort of sense? <laughs> rather, rather than a marketing person or an admin person or whatever. So I guess one of the reasons I didn't want to go ahead into an academic career, uh, even if age hadn't been a factor, was I, I didn't really want to get sucked into the organization, if you like, in, in that same way. Yeah, so people perhaps don't realise necessarily if they've not been too involved in that world that you know the two main things that people associate with academics are researching and teaching, and they, mm. <laughs> they don't get much yeah. of a look in a lot of the time. And uh, yeah, the, the last, the teaching, is is probably lowest on the the rung of importance. Uh, it's much more about you know research work and uh, bringing money into the institutions through gaining prominence. <laughs> I think there's a lot, of, absolutely a lot of that, and and that was a sort of pressure that I didn't didn't really feel I wanted. No. Um, and and you know, also I could see the the workload that that involves for, for a lot of people, um, which again is not 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 a road I particularly wanted to go down. I had a friend, actually a yoga student, several years ago, who was actually quite a high flying academic at another institution in London, hmm. and and I was just aware of how much work she had to do to stay on top of you know her research, her teaching, her role as. She's now a full professor in, in the institution and in her role. And, and I thought, oh, you know, I've got out of that life a little bit, out of, the, <laughs> out of the, you know, the, the rat race and off the hamster wheel. I'm not sure I'm going to go back onto a different one. Well, it's very so, interesting that you put it in those terms because, you know, obviously the academic world, like any other, can be institutionalized, competitive and, uh, you know, corporate to a certain extent. But, it, I mean, the whole idea of yoga studies would seem to be to try and bring some of the yoga into the studies <laughs> mm. and I mean you obviously did that in the, the subject you chose for your PhD focusing on the Upanishads um, but I wonder why why there isn't you know quite so much yoga in the studies <laughs> aspect of uh, you know the, the the world of yoga academia. Um, well I suppose 
you know, I'd throw that back at you and say, what do you mean by not much <laughs> yoga? And it's producing a well, lot of yoga. Well, I suppose. We both know how a broader term yoga is. <laughs> let's, uh, okay, let's, let's, let's define it a bit more specifically then. Um, in, in, yeah, in the world of researching the history and philosophy of yoga, for the most part, um, yeah, there's, uh, there's a lot of dry analysis involved. <laughs> and um, yeah, the, the, the perspective of the practitioner uh, is, is not, you know, brought to the fore except perhaps in a sort of uh you know, participant observation ethnographic kind of a way um but uh yeah there isn't there isn't uh there isn't really an interest in that experience and the, the whole part of yoga is about direct experience mm. so uh the further you go with the the academic analysis the, the the less of a look in that might get and the more one gets involved in the promotion of <laughs> one's reputation in order to stay afloat in, in in the competitive academic world so it's quite hard to maintain a, a detached mindset <laughs> in, in that environment that's what i meant really yeah i mean i, I, mean, I think you're right and I, I but i think i think the whole world i mean you use the term yoga studies um, mm. Which I think most people would acknowledge is that is a relatively new sort of discipline in its own right. Mm. But until really relatively few years ago, um, yoga studies or the study of yoga, I should say, perhaps in the academic environment, mm. it tended to sit in a religious studies department or maybe a philosophy de philosophy department. Um, you know, maybe there were some historians who were looking at it. Some ethnographers were looking at it um and when i you know when i first started my time at, at SERT, it was way before or certainly a few years before this whole idea of yoga studies had really taken off mm. and before so i had established its ma course in, in traditions of yoga and meditation and something i actually became very conscious of quite early on when i was doing my research around yoga things for my, my part of my MA course. Mm. I, I started, I was thinking, I, who are these people who are writing all these learned articles about yoga? Mm. Uh, and something that was very obvious to me was that I had no way of knowing whether any of these people were actually practitioners of yoga or not. You know, they mm. didn't, you know, they may well very well have been, but they didn't, they didn't emphasize that in, in, their writing, they didn't emphasize that in the way they put themselves forward. Uh, they weren't people whose names I recognized from the, the non-academic yoga world, if that makes sense. Mm. So I was actually quite conscious early on of what, on the face of it anyway, appeared to be a distinction between the people who were studying and writing about yoga from an academic perspective, you know, whether that was historically, ethnographically or whatever. Uh, and people who were sort of practicing yoga on the ground, if you will, <laughs> and absolutely there were overlaps. You know, absolutely, I, you know, I can, I, I have some very good friends who are very serious yoga practitioners, who I know are also scholars in in their own right, in in, in their own field. But it seemed at that stage, anyway, as if you know the two didn't really quite meet. If that makes any sort of sense, and. You know, I think that's changed. And in this world that we now call yoga studies that, that's developed, and I think SOAS has played a hugely important part in developing that as a discipline. You know, I think we do now start to see people who are clearly scholars in, in the academic sense, but also are clearly practitioners and, and in some cases teachers of, of yoga. Mm. Um, so I suppose the, the question that then perhaps starts to raise its head is which takes priority, you know, exactly. uh, or perhaps <laughs> yeah, more, or even more, you know, does one of them take priority, or, or do yeah. the two somehow successfully manage to inform each other? It's an excellent question. There's a phrase for for, for those listening who, who perhaps aren't so sort of uh, enmeshed in this world that does the rounds these days, the scholar practitioner. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the emphasis there is immediately it's like it compounds <laughs> Sanskrit puts together. But in the English language, you've got there at the beginning, the emphasis on scholar, um, a scholar who's a practitioner rather than 
a practitioner who dabbles in scholarship <laughs> so yeah. it does Did seem you read it clear. that way around <laughs> well yeah, yeah. so I mean, but it, obviously sanskrit compounds are more open to interpretation but in, in that in that specific context it does seem you know very clear to me that the front loading of scholar <laughs> tells you where the you know the emphasis is and the sort of you know general even even amongst those who are quite openly practitioners, uh, not drawing attention to one's practitioner status, and uh, I suppose the, the sort of classic example of this that uh, I've come across through my own reading and then through my own teaching, and people are almost being surprised to discover it, <laughs> is Mark Singleton's book Yoga Body, which mm -hmm. doesn't begin with a sort of positionality statement that <laughs> I teach and practice uh, hatha yoga in various forms and have done for mm -hmm. quite a while now, and that was sort of accompanying my research into these. Mm -hmm. Topics. I mean, he did write an article for Yoga Journal that sort of you know, alluded to that, but um, you know, that, that, that would have not been, you know, in terms of, you know, I guess, necessary information in his PhD, and it didn't seem like you know the, the thing to draw attention to in a book that was all about analysis, but it made it harder for practitioners to relate to what he was talking about, I think. I think that's, a, that's a, absolutely, I mean, I think you know, Mark Singleton is a great uh, example of somebody who, as you and I both know, mm. was absolutely a, a yoga practitioner, and indeed, as I understand it, you know, a trained yoga teacher. Indeed, yeah. Um, in, several, in several schools, I think. <laughs> in, in several schools before he embarked on the, the academic study that eventually led to that, that book, Yoga Body. Um, and I don't know, I mean, you, you suggest that it wasn't necessary for him to allude to that in his PhD work. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't know to what extent it would have changed anything if he had in terms of Hmm. how his work was received at an academic level so for better or for worse that's a really good point i had just assumed that you know based on the, the fact that people weren't advertising their, their practitioner kind of hmm. you know, subset that that it would have been better to leave it out um but you know, it might therefore actually had you put it in have suggested that this was all motivated by you know some other <laughs> kind of um inclination than than objective rational analysis it mm -hmm. might have been defending a particular lineage's point of view and so on and so forth so. yeah i can yes i can see that i can see that argument too and I, I don't you know i don't i don't know what the answer would be and i think the answer may well actually if we're honest about that might de depend very much on the institution and all the mm. particular supervisors and examiners involved and how, how, how they relate to that sort of uh, it's not really a dichotomy, but you know what I mean, that, that sort of dual role of the being the scholar and the practitioner. Well, there is a uh, tension, I think. I think, somehow. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. No, no, please. Um, but I'm, I'm curious so, yeah, what might happen if we turn the compound round then, if it, if it was the practitioner scholar, um, would something else happen? Well, you know, I, mean, you know, I think this is something which I think is actually happening in, in the world of yoga studies. Um, because I sort of see this when, from my early involvement, peripheral though it may have been, in the, the MA course at SARS. Because, of course, you know, who are the vast majority of students who come on to that MA course? They are yoga practitioners, very often yoga teachers. Not all of them, but they, very many of them are. And that course has been going now for 10 years, nearly. And so I think what we started to see are a number of people who have graduated from that course and may well be from other courses around the world. I don't want to focus exclusively on that one course. Mm. Who come to academia very much with their practitioner hat on. Mm. Uh, and I don't think they necessarily want to completely take that hat off, that hat off and throw it away. Uh, and get caught up in the academic world. So I think a lot of the people who have come on to those yoga studies academic programs, you know, I so I can't speak for anywhere else, but I suspect it's the case, are people who don't necessarily want to move on to a, a PhD, an academic career and so on, but they want to use the yoga scholarship that's out there to enhance, particularly perhaps thinking here of yoga teachers, to, to enhance their teaching. And indeed, you know, who knows, perhaps to influence and enhance their own personal practice. Hmm. So I think we've, we're seeing 
now two different, though perhaps overlapping categories of people, the, the yoga studies scholar, who may or may not be a practitioner, but for whom the, the emphasis of what they do is on the, the scholarship and the academic side of things. And the, what we've just called the practitioner scholar, <laughs> the, the yoga practitioner who wants to get more involved in learning about the academic side of yoga, but for whom it's that the practitioner bit is perhaps still the dominant bit of the scale, if you like, the dominant side of the, of the balance. They have different um, sorts of... So go ahead, yeah. No, I, I was just, I was just going to say, you know, it will be interesting to look back at those people perhaps in another five years' time mm -hmm. and, and see, see where the world of yoga studies is. But that's sort of what I, I'm seeing happening. I think you're right. I, I can also think of you know, a number of examples immediately who, who would fall into that category. And, mm -hmm. and at the same time, I can think of some parallels from 15, 20 years ago, people who popped up with maybe one or two scholarly articles as a result of doing you know, quite advanced level study, perhaps even to PhD level, but then yeah, put it aside and carried on mm -hmm. being a yoga teacher and just, just mm -hmm. use that to refine some aspect of their understanding or to explain in some ways what it is that they were doing uh, and where things came from uh, how a lineage you know, might put together its stories and yet at the same time how a historian might pick those stories apart and and you know to to provide something that has a little bit more depth a little bit more uh, intellectual rigor uh, behind its presentation to enable them to, to be better teachers so that I guess leads me to, to question what the difference is in motivation behind the research uh, do they come with different questions do you think scholar practitioners as opposed to practitioner scholars that's a great question. Um, I don't know. I find it hard to answer that, if I'm honest, because mm. I don't necessarily, I, you know, I think everybody comes at this with a, particular, with a different angle or a different perspective when they first come to it. Mm. Now, what they take out of it may well sort of bifurcate in the way that we've been, been talking about, but I don't entirely know what what really brings people to to these i mean i could throw that question back at you, you know, what, well please uh, do what, was, I your suppose, yeah. <laughs> for, what uh, was your motivation for taking the <laughs> ma course at summer well um yeah if, 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 if i'm really honest it was to answer the questions that i was struggling to answer for myself um because i had spent a lot of time with teachers in india who told all sorts of stories and uh yeah, the different stories didn't fit together properly um, and they didn't all add up. And the more I looked at them sort of individually, there were <laughs> yeah, inconsistencies and contradictions. And, and it became clearer and clearer to me that there was this whole soup <laughs> of yoga or the yoga tradition, as some people might want to put it, um, that, that was just a big melting pot into which all sorts of things were being stirred that had nothing to do with yoga, even in the teachings I was hearing about in India. And I, you know, I wanted some context for making sense of that. Uh, and uh, I was aware that, you know, with a kind of <laughs> more detached um, in inverted commas objective, although that's a, you know, a strange, strange word in itself. I came as a, you know, my, my professional background was as a journalist who got very disillusioned with the idea that objective reporting was in any way possible, although to a certain extent it remains a desirable <laughs> kind of pot of gold at the end of the rainbow that we're never going to find. Um, you know, I, 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 I could see that there was some merit to standing back with this detachment and trying mm. to find, you know, um, sort of overview through the magnifying glass. Of, you know, what's going on with these people who are talking about yoga and how do all those stories fit together? So I wanted that you know, to balance what I'd already had in abundance from elsewhere, which was an immersion in a practical perspective on yoga that uh, had all sorts of framing stories that didn't add up. So I wanted to find out more about what really did stand up to scrutiny. And the first thing I discovered was not a lot of it did. And that was quite demoralizing, dispiriting. It seemed to be a common experience of practitioners who entered the scholarly world. Um, and I felt, you know, a little bit disillusioned to a certain extent with 
the world of, of, of yoga academia in that it seemed to take a certain pride in <laughs> crushing these things to dust um, rather than trying to sort of, you know, perhaps do a bit more hand holding in. And I think this has probably mm -hmm. changed over the last decade uh, in terms of presenting, you know, well, this is what you think, you know, and this is why it doesn't quite look that way. And here's what we might do with that and where we might go with it and that's what gave me the impression that the two you know kind of orientations were somehow at odds um because i as a practitioner wanted you know um, something to hold on to <laughs> and academics seem to be fixated on the idea that any handhold i think i might have found couldn't possibly be allowed to exist because there was a contradictory one over here and therefore you know kind of um yeah, sort of intellectually analytically conceptually the thing in itself couldn't have an essence so it was almost nowhere <laughs> so it could, yeah, on the one hand it could isn't, be... that, isn't that part of their, part of their job <laughs> well it is yeah and, and there's this word that struck me which is what i was going to come around to um in the realm of academia that uh, defines what makes a viable project certainly at phd level and it's this word critical you have to critically engage with things mm. so you have to in some ways pull things to pieces that's, <laughs> that's academic study um and as a practitioner one is trying to knit things together to a certain extent to reach some kind of integration <laughs> so they are pulling in opposite directions and you can find a way to marry them obviously and people do but uh, that tendency seemed to me to be at odds I think, yeah, I, 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 I totally get that. And I think that, I suppose what, what I, would, I would come back to that and say, there, there are ways and means of doing things, aren't there? Indeed, and, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think it, it, it almost, to my mind, it certainly is part of the role of the academic world of yoga studies, without putting, you know, putting this too strongly, but to debunk some of the, the myths and the stories yes. that abound around, the extent that we can be objective in terms of the information that we present now of course as we we both very well know and, and you know, most of the people listening to this will understand that there's an awful lot about thinking particularly perhaps now about the history of yoga mm. there's an awful lot that we we can't be definitive about that we we just don't have the information and you know without Without trying to paraphrase, was it Donald Rumsfeld? You know, I mean, the, the known knowns and the unknown knowns <laughs> and whatever. Um, well, we just don't know how much we don't know. So it's... we don't know how much we don't know, and um, and there has always been a perhaps a tendency sometimes. Well, there's been two tendencies, I guess. But the, what I'm thinking about is 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 the tendency sometimes for people to want to, to really want to fill the gaps mm. and to want to fill the gaps in a definitive way. You know, yoga is or yoga was. Uh, and the more I've gotten got involved in any sort of academic study of yoga, the more I realize I, I, I can hardly ever say yoga is this or yoga was that. <laughs> uh, and something I always say to students that I, you know, that I teach any of this stuff to is that the one word I never use when we talk about the history of yoga is the word never, <laughs> because I just don't think we can pretty, we can really ever say. And, this never happened or this was never like this because there is just so much that we don't know i thought that was the ultimate truth from the upanishads graham nothing well, ever happened okay, right. <laughs> <laughs> you think there's an ultimate truth in the upanishads no, 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 no. It, it, it was a provocative <laughs> comment i take it back <laughs> yeah I'm not, i can offer you a phd thesis um no <laughs> but you know i think that perhaps going back a little bit in the, the days pre-yoga studies, mm. uh, and the, or the, you know, the days before any significant number of people were engaging with the academic study of yoga, any significant number of practitioners, I should say, were engaging with mm. the academic study of yoga, I, there was probably a desire among yoga teachers and yoga teacher trainers to, to want to fill in gaps and to want to present facts. Mm. Uh, and, you know, a classic example of this perhaps would be yoga comes from the Indus Valley. Uh, yes. And, and <laughs> as, as you and I both know, maybe, you know, we have artifacts that came out of the Indus Valley civilization, however long ago that was, that's 
if we were to pick them up and look at them, we would go, oh, yeah, that looks a bit like somebody in a yoga posture. But we have absolutely no idea why that person is in that particular part or that if it is, even if they are people, which is not always clear, right. why they are in that particular physical shape, why they're in that particular posture. So can we say this is yoga? I, I would say, no, we can't. Can we say this is not yoga? Mm -hmm. I would actually struggle with that, that conclusion too. You know, the yep. answer to me is that we just don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second tendency, there's, there's, there's that tendency to kind of fill in gaps uh, and, and want to be able to say yoga is this or was that. But then there's also, and this doesn't just apply perhaps to the world of yoga, but the desire to find something which you can label as authentic or perhaps mm. traditional. <laughs> um, and, and one of the ways that, you, that one does that is by making it as old as it possibly can be. Yes. So, you know, the older something is, clearly the more authentic and traditional it is. Uh, and, and again, so you see that in the way that people look at the dating of certain yoga texts, for example, um where people look to find the origins of certain yoga postures or practices historically well that's the yeah the sort of problem that people encounter because you know as far as we can determine that you know there's sort of three kind of key dates that do seem clear you know definitely at least two and a half thousand years ago it's with without doubt that there's something yoga-ish around that people are talking mm -hmm. about um but nobody's talking about making shapes uh, you know in sequences in fact you don't find anything other than sitting until about a thousand years ago and you don't find any sequences in group classes <laughs> until probably the 20th century um Later. that doesn't make that doesn't that, that yeah, well indeed yeah. Yeah. that doesn't make it all um you know in, in inauthentic or ineffective just because it's not old and it's this weird idea that old means authentic you're right yeah. and also it doesn't i mean we can't even categorically say it wasn't happening well it's true <laughs> you know, way back, you know, but we, we, we just, just don't, don't have any have evidence, evidence yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, so... there is a tendency sometimes to use the absence of evidence to basically allow people to make up whatever they feel like <laughs> based on the fact yeah. that it can't be the untruth of it can't be proven either <laughs> correct correct but you know i mean you go back, uh, you go back, you go back to Patanjali, for example, and or, or specifically to the commentary. Um, you know, whether we, whether or not we accept the commentary on the Yoga Sutra of the Basha as being by Patanjali or not, it's another conversation. But where we see that list of postures, mm. which on the face of it are all seated postures or potentially meditative postures, but there's this sort of tantalizing sort of Sanskrit equivalent of the word etc. <laughs> on the end there. So you know, what else was going on? Well, presumably um, other ways to sit. <laughs> well, one, one, one assumes so, but you know, let's not forget that we're in a um, in a situation where an awful lot of material is getting trans being transmitted orally and yeah, not being online. necessarily yeah. reflected in text. Or and or you know there could be there could have been texts out there that, that taught triangle pose and warrior two and so on <laughs> two thousand years ago and we just haven't got the material it's just not there anymore. Now or burned by the invaders. Yeah, likely, but, <laughs> but it, it's you know I don't think we could ever rule it completely rule it out. No, and, you're right. It's true. I mean, I made a flippant comment there, but you know it, we really can't rule out that any number of things didn't happen. Right. It's it's a hundred percent you know open to question and i suppose perhaps then yeah i'm motivated to ask uh, is that the main benefit for a practitioner of engaging with some academic study that you know it, it sows the seed of helpful doubt <laughs> i think i'd like I, I, i'd like to think it probably is um you know and i'd like to think that um some of the these people that we've called practitioner scholars Yes. So, you know, the practitioners who have come to academia, but where the practitioner hat, if you like, is perhaps the, the dominant one, are going to go out, particularly, the, again, as they're yoga teachers, they're going to go out into the practitioner world, if, if we can call it that, and have a much clearer and a much more nuanced understanding of where what they're teaching and what they're practicing has come from. Mm. 
Uh, and so I think that's an incredibly important thing to be happening in the yoga world. Um, you know, that the people are moving away from these sort of dogmatic myths that probably come ultimately, and I don't mean this disrespectfully of anybody, but come ultimately from a lack of knowledge. Mm. But, and, and as you said, and, you know, and again, I, I, don't want to, I don't want to be disrespectful or, or, or critical of anybody, but we also have running alongside all of this, we have the, you know, the academic yoga tradition, we have, excuse me, what we could use, loosely call the sort of the Western practitioner tradition. And then we've got, as you alluded to earlier, Daniel, all the stuff in India, Yes. Um, Indian yoga teachers who have probably been through, in many cases, many generations of lineage mm. where things have been passed on orally, interpretations have been given to certain textual sources, for example, that, of course, through time become hardened, if you like. They, they become the truth. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, again, I, I really don't want to be disrespectful of those sort of lineage traditions because I think they're very important, well, very significant aspect of yoga. But I think they do have that potentially, anyway, have that kind of impact. They do, but at the same time, I also encountered, which was, um, I suppose, the the path I didn't go far enough down because the only way of doing so is <laughs> to to just dive in and, and commit for, for the long term um, is, is to get involved with the, the more rigorous intellectual uh, traditions that you know, give us an Indian philosophy in the first place. And there are still institutions devoted to, you know, absolute you know, scalpel sharp <laughs> logical analysis of things and pulling things to pieces. They are within a particular you know, framework that we might broadly call traditional, but uh, mm. there's a lot of, um, there's one particular guy I met who, who um, was uh, half European, half Indian, who was raised from, from a very young age you know, in, in these uh, learning environments. Um, and he was very inquisitive and uh, very mm. open to hearing about Western scholarly findings, but also quite disdainful of the fact that the worldview from which he came was not regarded as being intellectually rigorous, and that it was somehow substandard and lacking. Uh, and there is a little flavour of that still hanging around in the yoga studies world that's supposedly so yeah. post-colonial. Yeah. yeah, I think there is. And I think, you know, um, I hope that's changing. Uh, you know, I, I think it is. From, from what I see from my slightly these days detached perspective from the, the yoga studies world, I, I, there are signs, I think, that people are paying quite rightly more attention to what's coming out of, basically coming out of India, going out of Indian uh, scholarship. Uh, it's a tricky one. I, you know, one of the first I, I mentioned before that I, I, for a while I taught undergraduate Hinduism. So I, mm. um, one of the first questions I, I always raised with, with my students there was, well, is it better to study Hinduism as a Hindu or is it better to study Hinduism as a non-Hindu? And, and, you know, we had that debate. What are the different perspectives that one gets from coming within, and it's not the Hinduism, you know, it could be Judaism, Christianity for that matter. You know, what, what are the different perspectives that one gets from coming at something from within some sort of tradition or some sort of lineage and what are the perspectives that one gets from coming at something from outside it and you know what are the pros and cons of each because neither is good bad right or wrong I mean, what are the pros and cons of each and you know that, that actually i think opened some people's eyes hmm. certainly at the undergraduate level to the fact that you know, i wasn't just going to be dogmatic about you know hinduism even if we could define hinduism says this that or the other um, and, and, and start getting them to question where they were coming from and their own perspectives on what we were, what we were talking about. And you know, I think we could do the same in yoga. Oh, we could. And I mean, this is again to think about how sort of you know what is yoga might come more into the scholarship. You know, asking who am I is a fairly fundamental mm. question. The inquiry mm. into the nature of you know, the self or um, the nature of consciousness uh, is, is fundamental to to what yoga traditions have 
grown out of. Um, and and yet, you know, at the higher levels of academic study have quite often come across people who aren't, you know, they're ostensibly performing positionality and telling you all this stuff about where they're coming from. But you know, actually, if I, I've, I've had a couple of run-ins of this nature with particular academics, I should be careful. But um, yeah, uh, effectively, uh, choosing to dabble in some yoga studies as you know, a viable kind of forum for playing with ideas although not really being interested in yoga per se interested mm. in you know, yoga for mm. its instrumental capacity to further their career give them something to analyze critique pull to pieces when their actual interest is something else so they're sort of analyzing yoga and it, it, through the prism of its inability to live up to certain criteria through the way that modern practitioners engage with it or something of that nature and I always end up saying well why pick on yoga <laughs> Yeah, well, <laughs> why forgot, well, it's kind of a kind of a trendy thing, isn't it? To, it uh, is exactly. To answer, yeah. to answer, there to you go. About. Well uh, said. It, but it just throws us right back to where we began, almost, which is you know those articles and books and what have you that I was starting to read as part of my early academic studies. And I'm, you know, is this person a yoga practitioner or not? I have no idea. Mm. Um, but they're writing about yoga. Um, you know, where at that stage I was. I've been practicing yoga for you know, 25 years or whatever, in, in some form or another, um, and, and was kind of new to the academic side. And, and there just seemed to be that, that mismatch, which, as we said earlier, I think is now beginning to shift in, in actually some quite interesting and, and different ways. Let's flip it all around yeah, from a completely different perspective, looking at what you just said there. Um, after such a deep engagement with yoga practice and at the same time having the intellectual rigor of somebody who's you know, done advanced study as well as you know, holding down a demanding corporate job, um, what are the actual benefits of engaging in yoga practice or perhaps even more specifically the study of uh, yoga philosophy, the inquiry into truth that uh, is actually at the root of yoga practice? Um, for somebody living in the world? What what are the everyday life <laughs> kind of um, fruits of engaging in this, this path? You didn't give me advance notice of that question. Did I you? didn't, did I? <laughs> <laughs> you any, or any of the others for that matter, really. You can, always, you, can always, you can always decline to answer or throw it back at me. I'm not sure I've got an answer, but I'm, I'm curious. It's, a, yeah, it's always to me interesting. We, we do what we do. We look at it. Perhaps even we could look at it academically and say, you know, what are the concepts that sort of seem to recur thematically through different presentations of yoga that seem to have relevance to the way we're living or, or, or you know, we really ought to pay attention to? Otherwise, you know, we won't have a way of life to look forwards to. I mean, you've alluded a couple of times to, you know, the question, who am I? Mm. Or, or, you know, or we could sort of refine that question, perhaps, and say, you know, what is the nature of the self, or the nature of the individual? Um, and... Just to pick that as one thing, I'm not saying this is the be all and end all, but the more that I've engaged with yoga as an academic discipline, the more important that question seems to be in the world of yoga. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, you know, it's, that's not something that you necessarily find emphasized if you go down to your local yoga studio tonight to do a class. Uh, it's maybe not even something you'll find emphasized if you sign up for a, a yoga teacher training course. Mm. But at its root, that question of the, across the yoga traditions, and I, I, you know, I emphasize the plural, that seems to be the fundamental question. Mm. You know, who am I? What is the nature of me as an individual? And how, if at all, does that connect to the world around me? I mean, what is my individual role? Am I trying to escape the world around me? Am I trying to operate within the world around me? And if so, how am I supposed to be doing that? Uh, and, you know, if I were to pick one, one thing yeah. that the academic study of yoga has really brought to the fore, for me, it's it's really it's it's probably it's probably that, and I think it's all and just as, as perhaps a, a 
an aside onto that, that it's also emphasized to me the importance of understanding that there are different ways in which we use the word yoga. Uh, and what I mean is that you know, we, we think of yoga very much in the West often as something we do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I do yoga. Yeah. You know, I, you know, I go to my yoga class, I stand on my head or whatever it is. Uh, whereas, of course, yoga historically is, is not just about something we do. It's about, if you like, a state of mind or mind or no mind, whichever way you want to think of it. That, that we look to achieve. Uh, and so I suppose yoga becomes more, it sounds a bit trite, but more about being than doing. I think it's trite at all, Graham. I think uh, <laughs> it's uh, the essence of, of what we're talking about in a way and why it's a bit distinct from the uh, <laughs> the, the practice of scholarship um, because uh, to, to attain a state of being. Um, one scholar once commented to me that, you know, scholarship is yoga. Uh, I mean, it's certainly a means of engaging with you know, concentration and focus on mm-hmm. a task um, and one can get quite absorbed in that, no doubt. Mm-hmm. Um, but is it necessarily asking that question that you were just highlighting <laughs> about what is it <laughs> the nature of the self? Um, and that's not something that one does intellectually. I mean, you can bring an intellectual kind of engagement to it <laughs> only if you're prepared to run out of words. Um, and... Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, ultimately, <laughs> almost by definition, it, it's something that can't be, as you exactly. say, you can bring an, an intellectual <laughs> analysis to it, but at the end and of the day, you're prepared to let go of that. <laughs> yeah, you've got to let go of that, and it's, 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 you know, it's not something that that can be contained within words, probably. So the you, know, two you, you give it a name, yeah. but you, you can't really contain it. So. Well, exactly. Yeah. So they're, they're, two, they're two different fields of inquiry in the end. Um, to, to actually engage in that inquiry is separate to the analysis of the ways in which people have engaged in it. <laughs> this is really what yeah. we're trying to come down to. Yeah. Yeah. And then I suppose we're, 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 we're left, though, with life in the world. <laughs> and uh, if, 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 we, if we do engage with the second part of what you were talking about, you know, what, what might arise from this... this uh, perhaps um insight that that might uh, enable us to to see more clearly how we relate to the world around us how we might live in that world with more skill if we're um, choosing to live in it rather than retreat from it mm-hmm. <laughs> and yeah I, I wonder again uh, looking at the various yoga traditions uh, are, there, are there any particularly striking consistent themes about how one does relate to the world around us and uh act more skillfully even though action is not often emphasized in these texts there are ideas about that, what that state of being might consist of without you know renouncing the world yes there are um are they consistent no i'm not sure they are really hmm. i don't know yeah i don't know i think there are again perhaps it's a question of emphasis more than the question of you know, com- com- complete sort of definition of one thing versus the other. But, hmm. you know, I, I mean, there's a lot of play made in the yoga world, the, the non-academic yoga world, about this idea that, that we often get taught when we first start, you know, yoga means union. Yes. <laughs> yoga means joining together. Um, we're all one. <laughs> we're all one. And again, as, as, as you well know, and as, as people listening to this may also well know that's by no means a universal teaching of yoga no. um but it's but is it a teaching of some traditions within yoga yes yes it is um and you know uh, for me as yoga has developed through the centuries it seems to me that that angle at least the angle of the sort of the interconnectedness of things has become more significant uh, and so I, I, you know, I can understand why that is taken on board a lot within contemporary yoga, and I think rightly so. I'm not sure that it's how it originates is always particularly <laughs> well acknowledged, and, and you know, sometimes completely misacknowledged. But um, you know, I think that's important, and I think yoga, this idea of yoga, is in some ways having something to do with. It joining together or being connected does become important and I think for me is important 
that's that's you know operating in the world in a way which acknowledges the if you like the inter interconnectedness or interdependence of things mm. whether that's other people whether that's within nature or whatever it is i think you know, i think that is important and i think that is something which develops through the yoga traditions i i would question a little bit whether it's always been part of the yoga, <laughs> the yoga <laughs> Well, I suppose, yeah, it all comes back to karma to a certain extent, ah. uh, this, this interconnection of action and its effects. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, the earliest Upanishad uh, lays that out, although it may not be the first source of that information because it sort of spreads across lots of different traditions, but yeah. interconnection on that level. Um, and then the sort of attempt to unwind the detrimental effects of these interconnected effects on the mind. Um, and and so, so there's that going on. But it seems yeah. to me that, that always ends up coming back to do less harm. And, yeah. uh, you know, that's that's not a bad place to start for all no, that absolutely. I like to <laughs> hector people about, you know, not getting too hung up on Patanjali's list of yummers. <laughs> yeah. Not harming in truth, uh, yeah, you can build a lot out of that. <laughs> Absolutely, but yeah, you know, let, let's not then go down into the, the, the rabbit hole of you know, what those mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, right. the, the do less harm approach for Patanjali is lock yourself up in a cave and to hell with everyone else, effectively. <laughs> effectively, yes, you know, and yeah. um, but it's you know, it, it means something quite different in in other contexts. Yeah, um, no, it's true, and. So, yeah, absolutely. I mean, if, if we were to sum it up in that, I, I would be quite happy with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems a good place to start. And, and then obviously, you know, we have, to, I think, guess what has become clearer and clearer to me? And I'm curious as to, I've, I've never, never, never dared to venture these opinions before somebody who's got, who's, who's got a PhD. I'm curious as to whether you think it stands up to scrutiny. It's come yeah, to, to, to my attention in a way that there's no possible way that we can engage in any of these texts without re reframing them somehow because they're from a different cultural context they're from a different time and place mm -hmm. and uh, they're not necessarily addressing our concerns although we've been mm -hmm. talking about interconnection and life in the world mm -hmm. those concerns are more broadly addressed when texts talk about dharma you know the, the way to relate to to the whole harmoniously and do the right thing or you know can be turned into lists of rules and goodness knows what else um but that's not often what yoga texts are talking about they're quite renunciate when it's down to the pure yoga practice and it's all about liberation and uh, liberation from the, uh, the the world in many cases um so we have to end up reframing things and i think therefore in, in, in some ways we have to build our own philosophy and actually own it <laughs> instead of mm -hmm. trying to pretend that these texts say things that we wish that they they, they had said and I suppose, you know, that's what stopped me doing a PhD was I realized that actually I couldn't do that and call it a PhD to come up with my own philosophy is it's basically theology. <laughs> it's not it's not yoga studies. Um, and I did for a while try to figure out if there was a way of doing that. But um, and then you have to learn a whole new methodology. And I decided oh, I've got other things to do. But I feel like we have we all have the capacity to do that in a very straightforward way for ourselves by being honest about the fact that we're doing a bit of cherry picking and a bit of reframing and a bit of yeah, reinterpreting and saying, well, this is my understanding of what yoga means to me as a 21st century Westerner uh, and not trying to pretend that Patanjali said it. I, yeah, I mean, I, there's a lot in what you just said there. That, um, I absolutely agree that honesty about what we're doing is extremely important. Because, you know, my, my PhD was actually not directly related to yoga. It, it was very much more around textual interpretation. Um, but very much from the perspective, and I, you know, I was very upfront about this in, 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 in what I wrote and what I did, that anything I say is my interpretation because it can't be anything else. Mm. However, you know, any interpretation of a, any single word by the hearer or the reader of that word is going to be an interpretation, mm. let alone a single sentence, let alone a, a text in a, a language that one you know, isn't one's native language. Uh, and, and what was it Wendy Doniger said about words in Sanskrit? Oh, goodness. Yeah, every word they, means itself, its opposite, it, uh, name of God and the position, position of sexual intercourse. Yeah. <laughs> You know, and, and so you, you take a text, however many thousand words of Sanskrit, and, you know, I, I, I'm by no means the world's 
great as Sanskrit is, but, but we're way, way, way away from that. Uh, but you know, you look at it and you look at it and you think, well, yeah, but this word could mean this, or it could mean that, or it could mean the other. Uh, and of course, then people come along to that text, particularly if they're coming from a particular religious or cultural or philosophical perspective, and they want the word to mean what they want it to mean. Mm. Now, it could, you know, it, that could be a valid interpretation because the word could mean what they want it to mean. But they don't always acknowledge that it might mean something else. No, if, I'm, if I'm making any sense. Yeah, at all, absolutely. Well, I mean, it. if it really comes down to context, is 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 the defining factor. Um, yeah, words make sense in context, and sometimes the contexts change over time, and mm -hmm. therefore the original contextual significance falls away. But uh, yeah, that's that's happened over over time in Sanskrit textual traditions. But if we're doing it fast and loose <laughs> in our in our modern context and mixing and matching these ideas with all sorts of other sources, um, it becomes, I think, even more important to not you know, sort of pretend <laughs> that yeah. it's all something we've got license to do and absolutely. to be a bit more open about the fact yeah, that we're, absolutely. we, we you know, are inventing think, a new thing. <laughs> yeah, and you know, and I think as a just to look at that from the point of view of a a yoga teacher. Mm. Um, first of all, I'd like to think that I'm always honest about where if I, if I do put forward any sort of philosophical ideas or historical ideas that I'm honest about where they're coming from. Um, and, you know, I, I will put my hand up and say sometimes I will gloss something a little bit mm. to fit the context of, of what I want to talk about, what I'm teaching at that given moment. But I hope without distorting too much what, as far as I can tell, the original text is saying. But I think it's the, as far as I can tell is, is the important side of that. And particularly when one takes a text that's, you know, let's say 2000 years old, yeah. it is a product of its time, its place, its culture. Um, the, the, you know, we can never be really privy to. Uh, and, and I think we, we must always keep that in mind. Um, and, and I think one of the very first things I was taught at Thalas when it came to looking at ancient texts was always to bear in mind the question, who is speaking to whom in this text? Mm. And I think that is, that it, again, it is really important. Uh, what is, you know, what, basically, what is the context? What is the context? Um, but acknowledging that, you know, we can pick up, we can pick up the Yoga Sutras off the shelf in how many hundreds of different translations, how many, many different interpretations by people who come at the Yoga Sutras with a really sort of hardcore let's work out what each individual word says and let's try and make sense of it. Or people come with a much more open, well, let's try and get a feel for what the yoga sutras are trying to say. We get people who come and say, well, actually there's a lot of Buddhism in here. Let's, let's try and look at the yoga sutras from a more Buddhist perspective. There are people who come to the yoga sutras and say, well, I think we can look at them from the perspective of Advaita Vedanta. There are people I know who go to yoga sutras and say, oh, well, let's, let's, let's have a tantric reading of the yoga sutras. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, and all of these philosophical viewpoints, whether it's Buddhism, whether it's you know, Advaita Vedanta, whether it's Chantra, they're all actually quite different. And that's before but we get to this. <laughs> let, let, let's try and try shoot one more. Yeah, they try to impose that onto, you know, I'm just picking the yoga sutras perhaps a little bit at random, but it's, it's something that's happened a lot with the yoga sutras. Hopefully people do that and um and okay if they acknowledge that's what they're doing then i don't necessarily have a problem with it as long as i understand that's where they're coming from mm. but if people don't understand where they're coming from and they just pick up one particular translation off the shelf and they read oh the yoga sutra says this 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 this, this without perhaps understanding that there may be other ways of looking at at that uh and you, you, that's even before we start to think about what a text like that can, or how uh, you know, how the teachings of a text like that can be relevant to us in the 21st century.
Right, indeed, yeah. And I think that the very basic question that you, you you outlined just at the beginning there um, is, is in no way basic <laughs> in terms of trying to answer it with yoga text. Uh, who wrote this and for whom is usually a mystery. <laughs> yeah. but often, often these texts are just there in a vacuum. We don't really know who was using them, how they were using them. Um, we're not even clear why they were produced necessarily because yeah. the people who were actually practicing were probably not interested in texts for the most part because they had a teacher who talked to them. And yeah. uh, it's, it's. I mean, one of the most common questions I get when I, I teach, when I teach about the, the, the text like the Hatha Pradipika, for example, mm. is you know, students say, well, you know, who's doing this stuff? <laughs> I have no idea. I have no idea. You know, this, I mean, I think there's a little bit of, a little bit of research that's been able to be done into, into this, but it's, it's, you know, it's, it's scratching the surface because we just don't have the, we don't have the records, or we don't have the evidence of, of who was doing these these practices. Well, I think trying to bring it back to you know, relating to everyday life, um, somehow being comfortable with the unknown is another dimension of, of, of yoga philosophy and <laughs> the practical outcome mm -hmm. of this uh, academic approach uh, that, that, that is really helpful, especially in this, this world of increasing discord, <laughs> instead of trying to get everything fixed and think I know and you, you know, you're wrong because you don't agree with me. Mm -hmm. uh, it's sometimes helpful to you know, embrace the unknown in that way. Um, although at the same time, obviously, to continue trying to find out, we don't have to yeah. shut down all inquiry just because we don't have the answer. But absolutely, the, absolutely. Yeah. You know, and I think you know this is where is where I think to go back to something we talked about earlier. This world of yoga studies that's grown up, I think, is is able to do an incredibly valuable service mm -hmm. to the world of yoga beyond academia. In you know, in asking the question in sometimes providing what seem to be answers as long as we you know we're, we're, we're mindful of context um that the people can use in the everyday yoga world can i call it that as we said earlier to you know to debunk some of the the myths or you know some of the the, you know, the dogmatic things that people are teaching still about or the origins of either of yoga generally or of, of certain elements of yoga. You know, those things are still being taught out there. Unfortunately. The yoga is 5,000 years old <laughs> stuff, or, yeah. you know, Patanjali was operating in 1,000 BC. I mean, that's, that that stuff is still being taught in the world. I, I know it is. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I think one of the things that the world of yoga studies is able to do for us as practitioners is give us the tools to, to be more questioning, to be more nuanced, again, to move away from, you know, the dogmatic yoga is, or the you know, yoga never was this, to, to acknowledging how much we don't know mm. and, and being comfortable with that. I wholeheartedly agree. I think that's probably... <laughs> A very good spot to 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 park it for now, and to 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 leave anyone listening with that question. You know, how do we feel about not knowing? Often, it's you know, it's an uncomfortable feeling at first, but it's uh, it can be deeply reassuring if we if we can allow it to be. Yeah, I, I sometimes tell a story about a very well known uh, American yoga teacher who I, I've been quite friendly with for for many years, hmm. uh, and he. When he came to London, he used to stay with us in our, in our house when I was living in London. And we were chatting over, over dinner one day. And there was a time when his son was about to go off to university. And so I, I said, oh, what's your son planning to study at university? And he sort of looked a bit doubtful. He said, yeah, he wants to study philosophy. So I sort of you know, walked straight into the trap, didn't I? So I said, well, yeah, what's wrong with that? It's a very you know, respectable thing to study at university. And yeah, but the problem with philosophy is that there are never any answers. <laughs> and, you know, that sort of stuck with me. <laughs> there, are, you know, there are never any answers. And, uh, and you know, that's what, one of the things that makes philosophy interesting to study, but makes philosophy actually also really challenging to study. Oh, indeed. And perhaps then yeah, the way forward is to allow some tentative provisional answers to coexist with the acknowledgement that they probably won't be permanent. <laughs>
Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you, Graham. This has been a really fun discussion. I, I feel yeah, like we could for, carry on for, for, for quite me. some time. I've yeah. enjoyed it. I've enjoyed oh. it. Well, thank you again. No, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, thanks, Daniel. Appreciate it.